if I can, I, w- I want to begin by um, asking you to recall a moment or a time of wonder, a, a moment when, when you experienced something so beautiful or something so powerful that you were left speechless, like just a time where you were, you were just in awe. I mean, think of a, a, a moment that captured you that way. For example, I, uh, I can recall a time I was down in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico with a group of students leading one of our missions trips down there. And um, I'd gotten up early. I just woke up for whatever reason. I was down kind of on the beach area and this is along the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And, um, and it was the sun was beginning to rise. And if you've ever been down in that area, the, the Sea of Cortez, the way the waves kind of crash up against the beach, it's almost kind of, it's, it's a little violent in some ways. There's just this loud sort of boom, wave after wave after wave. And I just remember sort of soaking in this moment and, and my heart, like in that, in that space at that time, being um, awoke to, is that right? Awoke, awakened? waking up to the reality that nature declares the glory of God. Like it just, it, I got it in that moment. Like it, I wasn't, it was almost speechless. And, um, it, and it was as if the waves and this rhythmic crash were just declaring like, it was like God's voice just being like, look what I've done. Like, I'm so good. I'm, I, you just saw how awesome he was. And that moment it was funny because I, I shared this story in the first service and one of the leaders that was on that trip came up to me said, I remember that. I remember, I remember that day. I was there with you when you shared that story with the students in the session that evening. She said, I've never forgot that, that picture of the waves declaring the glory of God. Similarly, I had some friends who a few years ago, they were on, uh, they'd gone up on business, but we're kind of doing a little vacation to a place in Canada called Banff, Canada. Has anybody been to Banff? A couple of you have? Okay, you are some blessed people, let me just tell you. Because I remember them posting these pictures on Instagram or social media, whatever it was, and Sherry and I kept going back and forth like, are you seeing these pictures? Like, where are these people? Because this place is, is incredible. And I remember when they got, they got back from their trip, this is in the, the Canadian Rockies, they got back from their trip and I was like asking them like, where, where did you go? Where is this place? And they were like, Sterling, it's, it's unbelievable. Like they, they, they had difficulty articulating just what they had taken. And in those pictures that you see, those, those are their pictures that they posted. That's not like a professional photographer or anything. It was just on their phone. It was like, this is this place where God was like, I'm just going to show off a bit here for a while. And like, just create uh, like unprecedented beauty. And the question I want us to kind of begin with this morning is what, what, where does that come from in us? What, what enables us to experience that? What, what, what is it that causes a sense of wonder to well up in us? What, what is it that allows us to, to have our breath taken away in a sense of awe? Why do we experience that? And furthermore, what does that teach us about ourselves? And what does that teach us about who God is and, and how we relate to him? As I mentioned earlier, we are in our, our second week of a 10-week series focused on a variety of, of different psalms. And each of these psalms is, is a little bit different because it reflects a different aspect or component of of what we experience as human beings in our relationship with with God. It kind of focuses on different seasons of the soul, if you will, and and articulates different longings of the heart. In fact, I think the Psalms captures a a, a bandwidth, a, a wide scope of what we experience in relationship to the world around us in relationship to our God, and that's the reason that we've entitled this series Songs of the Soul, because these are songs expressed to God and out of a whole wide range of of experiences with him. But I will tell you at the outset here that that I, I think there are two kinds of people in this world. There are people who get poetry, and then there's people like me, right? Like if it, it gets beyond like violets are, wait, roses are red, see? See, that's the first thing. Violets are blue, then sort of like over my head. And so my experience with the Psalms, if I'm being completely honest, has, has sometimes been difficult. 
because sometimes I've, I've gone into and I just feel like this, this artistic language is hard for me to relate to and it's just not how my brain works and, and I feel like sometimes I'm missing it. And yet the longer that I have been a follower of Jesus and the, and the more seasons of the soul that I've personally experienced, the more times that I have read a psalm where I was like, that's it. Like that's, ex that's exactly, it was as if the psalm was giving me a, 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 a prayer that my heart was praying that I didn't have the words to say. And, and I think that's what it does for us. And so my, my goal, our objective is I wanna invite us into an experience with each of these psalms, each of these seasons of the soul and think a little bit about what does it teach us about ourselves and what does it teach us about how we relate to, to God. And so today we're gonna to look at Psalm 8. And this is a psalm of wonder. It's a psalm that David expresses that he writes out of an experience of all with God. And we're gonna begin in, in verse one. Actually, I'm gonna just, if you notice, if you, it's not on the screen, but just ahead of this, a lot of times the psalms will give you a little bit of an explanation or some instruction, really. Um, this says, for the director of music, according to Gittith, a Psalm of David. So we know that David is the author of this Psalm and that it was written to, to be played on. Most scholars believe the Gittith is an ancient Philistine harp, like um, instrument. And so uh, Taylor O'Brien wrote the arrangement that we sang in the offering today um, that we heard of Psalm 8. And I told him, I was like, there was a noticeable lack of Gittith in, in that. Um, but apparently he's having his restrung right now. So. Next week, we'll play the get to. So there's these instructions, and this is what David writes. He says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the, works, uh, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are man mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels. You've crowned them with glory and honor. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands and you've put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, as we process David's psalm here, I want to begin by looking at this question that he asks in the center of the, of the psalm, of this poem, and it's a question of wonder. It's a question born from, from wonder. Verse 4, what, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. See, David appears here to be pondering to asking the one of life's quintessential questions. A question that I think, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us have wrestled with to some degree or another at one season of life or another, which is simply like, who am I? What, what is my role in this whole big scope and scene that I see unfolding around? How do I relate to the rest of this? And, and, and how does something, the, the, soap, the scope and scale of me matter when, when all of this is unfolding around me, when this seems so big and, and I seem so small, and it's a question of wonder and scale, right? And it's all, we all do this when, when we get various points of reference. For instance, when I was in a college student, I've told you before some of my athletic prowess and lack thereof, and so when I went to college, I played intramural basketball. It was like right at my pace, right? These were the guys that didn't make the team and yet still liked to play sports. And I loved it. It was, it was fun. We had a great time. And when I played intramural basketball, I was like, I fit right in. Like I'm, I'm about 6'1", and I was probably one of the bigger, but certainly not the biggest, but I definitely wasn't the smallest guy that played intramural basketball. I was like right kind of in the, the talent level of the rest of the guys, and we had a lot of fun, a ton of fun. And so when I compared myself, and that was my point of reference, I matched up okay. But at, at Moody in the Solheim Center, on occasion when NBA teams were in town to play the Chicago Bulls, if there was a 
uh, something already established at the United Center, um, like the Blackhawks were setting up or something like that, they would come to the Solheim Center to practice visiting NBA teams. And as a sports fan, I just, I thought that was fantastic. So I would go over and I would watch these players play. And on one occasion, the New York Knicks were in town and they were down in our gym and I got word and I go over there and literally like, like Patrick Ewing walked just within feet of me. And I don't know if you know who Patrick Ewing is. He was like a star player on the Knicks in like the, the 90s and 2000s. And he's about seven feet tall and, and probably like 245 to 60 pounds. I don't know, so he's big, he's real big. And like literally when he walked into the door to the gym, he had to like, fold in half and like scoot through like because he just like nothing is made for somebody his size i was there one time when when shaquille o'neal who's about seven one it was in there practicing free throws in the gym and i was like you got more wrist you got to get more wrist. he did not appreciate my feet <laughs> and and he is a mountain of a man he is gigantic and so when my, when my point of reference changes, when I look at something bigger, right, the, the scope and scale, how I understand myself changes. And this is what David is experiencing in this psalm. He's, he's looking at something greater than himself and he's asking the question, who am I? Back in Psalm chapter eight, if you pick it up in the end of verse one, he says, you've set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, then he asked the question, what, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that, that, that you would care for them. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna dive real deeply into verse two here because it feels a little bit like David has like a, a train of thought that's going along and then takes like a, a sideways turn and then comes back. But I will say that, that that verse is actually interesting because it's a verse that Jesus quotes um, in a time when he's in the temple and he overturns these money changers tables and he, there's, there's injustice happening in the temple and he's like, this is not, this is not gonna happen here. And there's some children that, that unsee this whole scene unfold and they start to yell and they're like, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the son of David. And all the people in charge of the temple get real upset. And, and they're like, aren't you going to silence this? Aren't you gonna, and he quotes in that moment, Psalm eight, verse two. He says, listen to the children, listen to the praise of the children. Do you, do you understand that they, they get what you're missing? Do you understand in this authentic, natural, observed sense of wonder and all they see what you are frequently missing? And, and David points out that Jesus echoes David's sentiment here. The, the children capture, they declare this sense of wonder and awe. Some people view verse two as a, as a messianic indicator of, of how God would redeem and destroy the enemy of death and hell and sin and all that through, through the innocence and infancy of a child and all of this. And Jesus quotes that verse, but when we look at the whole context here and we go back to this question that David asks, how do we relate to all this? What is man that you're mindful of them? David here is, he's asking a question born out of this experience of awe. He's looking at the scope and the scale, the beauty that's on display. He's, he's looking at the night sky and he sees the glory of God. He, he looks at what's unfolding around him and he sees the ability and the nature of God being put on, on display in the night sky. And he responds in that moment in a place of humility with a question, why do we matter in all of this? Why do you bother to, to pay attention to us when all of this is going on? Eugene Peterson, who is a um, professor and author, he passed away um, about a year ago, I think. Um, and he's probably most famously known for his translation of the Bible that we call The Message, where he sought to... Um, he sought to take the idea of scripture and instead of translating it in a, in a word for word sense, he tried to understand the meaning of it and put it in a modern vernacular. How would we communicate this? Here, here the way he translates these verses. 
This is from the message. He says, I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. And then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? And, and I think Peterson captures it so perfectly. Because what it's interesting as we look at David's question here and his sense of wonder, it's, it's captured in both the, the vast scale of, of what he sees around him, of what his, his response to creation, the enormity of it, but then it also captures uh, the, the care and the precision with, with which God has done this. David uses a very interesting metaphor here. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers. See, oftentimes in the Old Testament, if an author wanted to describe or talk about the strength of God, he would use the metaphor of the arm of God to, to refer to his strength. Or perhaps if, if they wanted to emphasize the sovereignty of God, they would, they would use the metaphor of God's hand, God's right being in control of everything. But David here uses a pretty rare metaphor when he talks about the, the fingers of God, the work of his fingers. And in doing that, David is capturing the, the, the personal and the careful nature with which God has created. That this isn't just some removed, some, some absent God who just sort of got this ball rolling and then, but no, it's, it's precise and it's personal. It, it is as if the artist who is painting his master teeth know every detail of the canvas, right? When I was a kid, my, my family occasionally would go down to Cincinnati to visit the children's museum down there. And one of their features was this gigantic train set. Like, like much larger than, than this room, hundreds of trains going every which. And, and it was designed in such a way that there was all these different stories being told. There was like an urban setting and then there was like a rural kind of small town setting and there was countryside and there was all of this. And, and everywhere you looked, you would see all these little figurines and different people and trees and bushes and shrubs and rows and cars and it all told a story and somebody meticulously placed each of those little figurines that were interacting with each other. You could almost imagine what it was saying. And this is what, this is what David is envisioning here. He's seeing this, the canvas that has been painting, and he sees the specifics of the artist on display. And all of it evokes this response of, of glory, of worship. He's recognizing what God has done in this how all of it reflects his glory, how all of it is, is on display around him. And he says, what is man that you're mindful of him? Human beings that, that you would care for him. So this question of wonder here is followed up by David then with a proclamation of worth. A proclamation of worth. David answers his own question. When, when, you, when I was a kid, one of, the, one of the things that my brothers and I kept ourselves busy with was uh, collecting baseball cards. We would, we would get our allowance money, we would ride our bike over to like the convenience store and we would buy packs of, of baseball cards and, and we would trade them and we'd play games with them, we'd fold them, like we totally ruined their value or if they had any, you know, uh, that sort of thing. But we had a lot of fun. But one of the things that, that we would pay attention to is we knew that on occasion, we'd buy these little magazines that told us about what their value was. And on occasion, you'd find out that there had been a misprint. And if you found a card that was a misprint, and ironically, actually, because it was um, different and because there was just a few of these, that's where the cards that had sometimes immense value were found. Those were the ones that were actually worth something because they were unique, because they were different than everything else that had been created. And, and, and the key as the observer was to be able to understand their uniqueness and understanding their uniqueness capture their value. See, David answers this question that he's asking by recognizing the unique nature of what God has created in humanity. By understanding that our value and our worth, the very reason that God deemed us worth redeeming, that, that he decided to interact or to uh, act on our behalf in order to save us, is because we are set apart from all the rest of creation. Again, if you look at Psalm 8, verse 5, 
This is what he says, speaking of humanity. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the seas and all that swims in the, the paths of the seas. So the, the, the creator God, the one who sustains everything that we see all around us, the one who created the very things that, that take our breath away, because you and I, David captures, are unique amongst all of his creation, we've been given an exalted status. We, we, we have been crowned, it says, with glory and honor, right? I don't, when is the last time you felt that? When is the last time like you woke up in the morning, looked at yourself in the mirror, and you're like crowned with glory and honor, right? Like we, we miss this. When is the last time you understood that about the people that are sitting around you? about the people that you do life with. This is what David, he's saying, this is why God has chosen to pay attention to us is because he did something different in us. He, he is echoing Genesis chapter one. If that sounded familiar to you, it, David is playing right along the depiction of the creation of, of man and woman in Genesis one and what God says is our role and why we're different. In fact, let's turn there real quickly. This is um, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. This is the sixth day of creation. And it's, if you read all of Genesis, this, is, this reads like this, kind of like this escalating, um, uh, there's a rhythmic poetic pattern to it that's kind of like building. And it gets to day six, and this is this culmination of this creative work. And this is what, this is what it says. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So the uniqueness that David is capturing here is out of a reality that when God made us, he made something different. That, that he invested, he embedded in us his own image. In fact, when the NIV translates that verse, he made us a little lower than the angels. Uh, the ESV, as we read earlier when we recited it together, he, he translates that you made us a little lower than, than the heavenly beings. That is, that it's a little bit of the translators playing it safe here. Because that Hebrew word translated angels and heavenly beings, that's the Hebrew word Elohim. That, that, is, that is the Hebrew word that we most frequently translate as, as God. Like the psalmist is saying, David is saying, you've made us just, just a little lower than yourself. I think Eugene Peterson translates that verse saying, we just narrowly missed being God. Because he, he created us in his image. The, back to that original question, where does our sense of wonder come from? Where do we, why do we experience that? It's because we're image bearers. Because when God created us, he created in us a capacity to understand and appreciate something that is unique of him. Beauty, the created order, his magnificent on display. We are the ones who stop and pause and, and give notice to that. When I took my dog out the other night to go to the bathroom, right? And there was a beautiful sunset coming in from the west and I'm just standing there taking it. And my dog didn't, oh, you know, she's not... She's not noticing that. I notice that because I'm an image bearer, because you are an image bearer. David is talking about the uniqueness of what God has done in us. It's because you carry his image. More than any other aspect of all of God's creation, humanity reflects and represents God. You're crowned with glory and honor. See, we, we can't understand the significance of humanity if we fail to acknowledge and recognize and understand the glory of God. Let me say that again. We can't understand the significance of humanity if we fail to understand, recognize, and acknowledge the glory of God. And David is capturing this, powerfully capturing this. Elizabeth Elliot, who was a, a missionary in Ecuador, who was part of the story of the five missionaries. Her husband was one of them who was killed um, in an effort to bring the gospel to a local tribe 
there and, and um, her story is amazing, but she's an incredible author and this is how she describes this. She said, it would seem that unless we see through and beyond the physical, we shall not even see the physical as we ought to see it, as the, the vehicle for the glory of God. So unless we see beyond the physical, we're never gonna see the physical as we ought to see it. It's, this, it's a vehicle for the glory of, of God. And what's it, what strikes me about this, and, and, and maybe this has occurred to you, is that how just incredibly relevant Psalm 8 is to our cultural narrative. We were talking about this as, as with um, the preaching team when we were talking about this passage and working on it, but Psalm 8 speaks directly into some of the cultural narrative, or if you will, I would, I would say cultural heresies that we have in our world. Both one, that, 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 that we see ourselves, humanity and the cultural narrative as the pinnacle of like the, the evolutionary trajectory. So we're, we're all there is. We are the bearers of truth. We're the, we're, we're the ones who decide what is right and what is wrong. We're at the, the upper echelon of, of what exists in this world and therefore we are essentially our own gods. And, and David is saying you, you, it's, you bear his image, but you're not him, right? Because we can't do all of this. Like he's saying it's evident in creation. But it also speaks against another cultural sort of narrative that says we're on par with everything else. That, that we're just one aspect of the organic world, that, that our value and our worth is, is the same as the rest of, of plant and animal life. And David says, not true. Embedded in you, you carry the very image of God. It, it speaks against the, the cultural narratives that would seek to over-elevate or under-elevate who we are. And so David says, God pays attention to you. He cares about the individual aspects of our lives and our components because you are unique amongst all creation. Because you are crowned with glory and honor. And all of this for David then leads to a response of worship a response of, of worship. I think the inevitable question that we have to ask ourselves when we're reading a psalm like this is, is, is what do we do with this, right? At least that's, that's where my mind goes to. What does this ancient Hebraic poem have to do with my modern life and my experience and my faith in Jesus so many years later in such a different context? And I think for David, He's saying, when we capture this, when we get this, it, it, it begins and it ends with worship. L literally, in this case, right? At the, at the beginning of this poem and at the end of this poem is the same refrain. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so I wanna just real quickly, I wanna, I wanna suggest three ways that we can respond in worship when we, when we have moments and experiences of wonder in our lives when we understand our uniqueness in, in all of creation. The first is I think we worship him when we give credit where credit is due. This, this is what David is seeking to do when he's taking all of this in. He's saying, this is, this is you. You can do things that, that we can't. This is beyond us. It brings him into a place of humility. We talked about this this summer when we did a, a series on spiritual disciplines. We talked about the discipline of of noticing when our hearts and our minds are awake to the awe and the wonder that's unfolding around us, right? It reminds us of who he is and that, and that we're not him and that's a good thing because it is only in a place of humility that we are really able to see and to enjoy his glory. That's when we give credit where credit is due. Secondly, I think we worship him when we reflect his image accurately. When we reflect his image accurately, all of creation reveals the glory of God, but only, only you and I, uniquely humanity, mirror that image. Only you and I accurately can reflect him because we're image bearers. It, it defines not only the sense of value and worth that we have intrinsically as, as God's created um, men and women, but it also defines how we view things like human rights. It, de it defines how we view the value of every human life. We, you and I cannot accurately display the image of God. We can't accurately portray our, our creator while simultaneously devaluing and belittling other image bearers. 
Like it's, it's incompatible. So we, we worship him when we accurately display him to the world around us. And then thirdly, we worship him when we serve him. Like David is clear here when he echoes Genesis chapter one. Verse six, he says, you made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Is that you've been given a job to do. You, you've been given a responsibility. We, we serve our creator king, and he's put us here as stewards of his creation. That impacts how we relate from image bearer to image bearer, but it also impacts how we relate to the world around us and our responsibility in that, each of us to his creation. In all of these ways, when, when we give credit where credit is, is due, when, when, we, when we relate to the rest of creation by accurate, really, accurately reflecting his image, and when we serve him faithfully as stewards of what he's created, then we worship his name. Then we, like David, with our lives say, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And I was thinking this week about, about the moments, the stories, the times in life when I've captured this most acutely, most personally. And, and of course, I've got stories like the ones I've told where I've, I've observed it in nature and I've been moved to, to worship where I've, I've recognized his greatness. But I can tell you that the, the story that reminds me most powerfully of, of God's created order, his world in us, and his personal care and attention to me as an comp- aspect of that creation is the story of a, of a nine-year-old boy sitting in his bedroom with his dad asking questions. And his dad explaining to him for the very first time the gospel in a way that I, I just gave it away. It's me, it's my story. The way that I could understand and relate to and respond to the first time in my life when I understood that I needed grace in my life and that that I took a step of faith to place my trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. The, the, The thing that inspires the most awe and wonder in my life is when my heart is acutely aware of the nature of grace and the experience of it personally. And then when we live that out, image bearer to image bearer, when that becomes not only the reality that I've experienced from him, but that becomes the reality that we live out together in this world, when we see it, when my heart is captured by it, I, I, I'm speechless. And what he's done and why he would choose to do it, how do you even begin to describe it? It's so good, so beyond what, what I deserve or what I've earned or, or anything like that, but he chooses to do it because, because I'm unique. You are unique in all of his creation because you carry his image and he says you're, you're worth going all the way to the cross for. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time just to again enter into your word and to look at this psalm and to be reminded of your glory put on display. The sense of wonder and awe that, that surrounds us and Lord, we wanna be invited back into that. And in the midst of that, we say, we ask the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? human beings that you care for him. It's because that in us, you have carried your image. You've embedded it in us. So we pray, Lord, that that we would encounter grace, that we would be in all of you. And in response, we would worship your name. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.